State estimation. Woo! <laughs> I was, hey, don't look at me. Okay, let's start by talking about, with a humanoid robot, typically what sensors are available and what we want to measure. So, <coughs> what sensors are typically available? Sorry, position. Position. Velocity. What's that? Joint velocity. Sometimes joint velocity, but not always. Uh, I am used to usually have accelerometers and typically rate gyros. Which would give you so joint positions, let's call that Q, joint velocities Q dots. Uh, accelerometers, um, A vector, rate gyros, so omega. What else? Foot sensor, um, force sensor. Some sort of force or ankle sensor. Force torque. Ankle. Force or torque sensor. Wrench. Twist. For the, you mean for the force sensor? For well, the torque yeah, just exactly. Yeah. Yeah, let's just call it a wrench on the foot. Alright, what else? We usually have camera. Sometimes joint torques. So some of these pretty much transfer straight over, so we do want to know the joint positions. And velocities. Okay. What else? Center of mass, position, velocity, acceleration. Maybe let's not say acceleration. Um, it's not really a state thing, yeah. mm -hmm. really. It's more uh, input. Alright, what else? The pose of the robots with the respect to the wall. Pose of the robot, so let's go up and right. Um, the pose of orientation are different with respect to what planes, right? Well, let's, so we already have, if we have the center mass position and the joint positions, then we know the mm -hmm. position of everything. We need the orientation of at least mm -hmm. one body. So, so an orientation and an angular rate, which could just be a maybe and maybe again, so some sort of angular rate. <coughs> of the center of mass? Well, of, the, the no, mass, not right, of, of oh, one body, yeah. of some reference body. Does it have to be a body? Yeah, some... Can't be a point. Something you not know in your world. No, what I'm saying is it, it, it will need to be a vector. Let's do a, be a, a body right now. So, so like the chest or the pelvis, or you could even have it be the left foot. It doesn't matter just if you have, if you have the orientation and the angular rate of some reference body, and you have the joint positions and velocities, then you can also figure out the orientation and angular rate of any yeah, it can of be the a vector. Oh, okay. And that, orient can, that orientation can be with respect to a vector rather than a body yes. in the world outside the world. Yep. Okay. Contact with the environment. Uh, contact. Contact conditions. What point 
elements are contacting them, and also where it's contacting maybe the forces of contact, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Set some of these map directly so to get joint positions you just get the joint positions if you have joint velocity measurements well then you just have them but sometimes you don't have those because you don't have those sensors so you have to differentiate the joint positions somehow to get the center of well let's go orientation to get the orientation at low frequency you can use accelerometers they'll tell you which way are was which way is down and then at high frequencies, you can use a rate gyro, which will tell you which way down it's changing. So you kind of fuse these two together to get orientation. Um, for the most part, uh, angular rate uh, comes from mostly from the rate gyros and well, also the accelerometers. So pretty much your high angle things. Um, contact conditions can come from this, but it can also come from knowing something about the environment. Your cameras can be used to augment a lot of these things. Do a different color. Yeah. So the camera and LiDAR go for orientation. can help for things like orientation or position or contact conditions. Um, but it's going to be more low frequency information than with LiDAR. Can do these sort of things. Um, joint torques, I guess we do want to know what, uh, we want to be able to control the forces, so mm -hmm. I'll just put joint torques over here again. Okay. Why are we leaving out acceleration? Because it's not really, acceleration, not usually state very it's not really a state variable. You really want to know where your position and velocity is. Your acceleration is going to be a function of all of your dynamics. So really kind of what your accelerometer is telling you is what was your acceleration previously, not currently. I don't know. It's, it's kind of an odd one. In, in some of the stuff we do, we actually do have uh, acceleration as a state variable because it has to be fed back for some other, but we won't, we won't get into that right now. No, I will say just parenthetically looking forward to tomorrow's lecture. It would be important, but not for today. Yes, so let's not talk about it. Okay. Um, all right, so these are the sensors we have. These are the things we want to estimate for the most part. And let's keep the, keep the discussion focused on what you need for balance for the most part. Um, so let's next talk about how good do our estimates have to be in order to balance. So keep the estimates up, get rid of the sensors. All right. And here's kind of how I like to look at it, is that if you have, if you have a robot, Its center mass height is going to be, for a typical human or humanoid, somewhere on the order of about one meter, give or take, a little bit. And then if you look at a typical foot, well, it's typically a foot long, so about 30 centimeters, and somewhere around 10 centimeters wide. Okay. And in order to balance, well, so let's look at the top view of the foot. If it's 30 centimeters by 10 centimeters. If you think your center of mass is here, but it's really there, then you're going to have problems. Right? So there's going to be kind of some error bound on your center of mass that's important. And I've typically used a error bound of a radius of about plus or three, plus or minus you know, three centimeters in any direction, I think is a good number. So center of mass position, somewhere around three centimeters resolution. 
Uh, if you can't get that, you, you're going to have trouble balancing dynamically. Um, if you can do significantly better than that, then it's great. You know, somewhere, somewhere under about a centimeter, and you're really not so uh, gaining anything by getting any better. So if we pick something up, if we don't know the mass of it, we're pretty much done. If if you don't do something about if you don't if you don't if, we, if you don't do a better estimate of your center mass position after you pick up your mass, and it's a heavy mass, sure, then you okay. can fall over because of that. Deal with disturbance. Yeah. Well, <coughs> okay, but there's a lot of in. Depending on how your controller is, you don't necessarily need to know your center mass position to within three centimeters, but you have to be doing something about errors greater than three centimeters. It might be some old loop stability type thing, but this is kind of what you need if you want, if you're actually using feedback. Um, okay, so okay, so now as far as joint position goes or orientations, if you're at a meter meter high and you need to be within three centimeters on the ground then this angle can only be off by 0 0.03 radians if this length is one meter which is typical center mass height right so if your if your orientation of your body is off by more than 0 0.03 radians your center mass is going to be off by more than three centimeters 0 0.03 meters right because it's just this angle times that distance is this arc length. So how many degrees is that? Uh, what was it? Like? Uh, 0 0.5. Right? A half a degree. It's mm. one and a half or point zero three. One yeah. point zero three is one and a half? Yeah, yeah. one and yeah. a half degrees. <coughs> so joint positions, about point zero three radians. If your joint positions are worse than that, then you're going to have trouble. You mean cumulative joint positions? Well, yeah, cumulative, yeah, if any one is greater than that, then you're really having trouble. Uh, you'd have to, you know, it'd be a lot more complicated to do the cumulative stuff, but somewhere on the order of 0 0.03. So if you can get better than 0 0.01, then you're probably doing okay. Is there a Jacobian result that gives us you, that? You could, you could do, yeah, I'm just doing rule of thumb numbers right now. Okay. Okay, so, uh, and then that would also be orientation. joint velocities. So for this we can go back to uh, instantaneous capture point stuff. So we are saying before with ICP that if you take your center mass position and multiply and look at its velocity that your instantaneous capture point is going to be uh, x ICP equals x COM plus Square root of, uh, let's see here, Z naught over G, X dot COM. Okay. So for a human, at one meter, gravity is about 10, square root of one tenth is about 0 0.03, or sorry, 0 0.3. Right? And so with the same reasoning before, if we want a ground reference point to be within three centimeters, so if this were three, Yeah, if these guys have to be within about 0.3 centimeters, then the most error you could have in this is about 0.1 meters per second. Because 0.1 times 0.3 is about 0 0.03, 3 centimeters. So as long as your center mass velocity is within about 10 centimeters per second, you're okay. So these are amazingly loose, amazingly generous tolerances in distance and, and, and speed. Measures. Yeah, well, I mean, you want to be, I would say you want to be significantly better than these. You know, if you can do a factor of 10 better than these, then you're doing okay. If you're worse than these, then you're going to have a lot of trouble balancing. So 10 centimeters a second, you know, that's 10 centimeters to one second. So you're talking about that fast. So if your velocity measurement is within that speed, then you're okay. Okay, um, and then I guess joint velocities, you could do the same thing and propagate back and say, okay, if, if this has to be within 10 centimeters per second, 
then this angular velocity down here estimate would have to be within what? Um, Is it going to be different for the point one, or geometry? Point 0.1 radians per second. Are we short joints won't matter as much as angles. Short, short segments. Yeah, matter. I'm just looking at the wor worst case rule of thumb numbers okay. here. I'm not trying to be perfect. Our, sorry, just for quick clarification, you say joint velocities, that's angular velocity? Yeah, so the okay. joint angular velocity. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, radians per second, sorry. If this guy's moving at 0.1 radians per second, yeah. and you're estimating what this velocity is based on that measurement, then if that is 0.1 radians per second in error, then your center mass velocity will yeah. be 0.1 uh, meters per second or 10 centimeters right. per second in error. And which then will propagate to a three centimeter error in right. your instantaneous capture per location. Okay, and then angular rate of reference body would be about the same then uh, 0 0.1 radians per second. So why are we at 0 0.1? Because the cumulative can only be, or why is that worse than the orientation? Well, they're, they're different units, right? Orientation is 0 0.03 radians. Right. This is 0.1 radians per second, which, let's just do rule of thumb here. So if you're going, um, one radian is 50 degrees. So this would be about five degrees per second. So about, about that's about the speed. Or let's hear 10 seconds to go, 10 seconds to go 50 degrees. So I guess that's pretty slow. And why is it, why is it so? critical? Is it, is it just direct geometry correspondence to the 10 centimeters per second velocity tolerance? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it can probably be a little bit looser just by using intuition here, because if it takes 10 seconds to get from there to there, that's, that's really pretty slow. So somewhere around somewhere around 0 0.1 to 1 radian per second. Let's loosen it up a little bit and say 0 0.3. There. Okay. Contact conditions. Well, you pretty much have to know that you touch the ground within, I don't know, if you're, if you're using your ground contact conditions as a switch, somewhere around 50 milliseconds is, is a good enough time. Yeah, and kind of on the scale of walking, a tenth of a second is, is a long time, enough to kind of start falling. 50 is really kind of long, too, maybe even, in fact, that should be, be about 20, let's call it 20. All right, joint torques, oh, I don't know. We've had many discussions about that. Okay. okay. Just be great body weights, right? All right, so let's just keep on going. Um, so that's approximately what accuracy we need for balancing. Okay. Rule of thumb, I would say. So now let's talk about what are the sources of sensor noise. Physics. There's temperature drift on, on some. Okay, physics. The laws of nature. <laughs> uh, temperature. Sometimes the temperature has to do with uh, load conditions. But it's temperature. Electrical noise. noise. Electrical noise. Electrical noise. Right. So the noise might be different based on if this work motor is working or that one sending RF or fluctuations. In the yeah. What else? Color. What's that? Noise, but you might have time delay. Time delay? What would vary the time delay? Just the time it takes to read the measurement and convert it to an electrical. Well, okay. that is the Especially like time delay, but what would, what would cause a change? Calibration. Well, it doesn't matter offset. if there's a change, just any time delay is going to be sensor noise. Calibration, okay. offset in measurement. Okay. Say it again. Offset in measurement. Right. Drift. Like temperature and so forth? Or just no, constant. Right. Vibration in the system. Like mechanical vibration. Yes. And then just. Or a mechanical connection. Mechanical mm -hmm. What about 
hysteresis, fatigue, and elastic and kind of structural elements? Hysteresis. Phase of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. Whether you're holding your mouth the right way. Uh, just about everything. Uh, and, and then certain sensors they have to calibrate for phases. Yeah. Give me name. Uh, uh, one sensors. of them where they have the ground and they have to know how level it was and the curvature of the ground was based on the tides that nearby. Yeah. Yeah. Would you call uh, magnetic interference electrical noise? Sure. Or would that be separate? Electrical. Mm -hmm. yeah. electrical. Yeah. Well, I wasn't, yeah, induction too. I was talking about external fields, but uh, fields any, generated any from induction. Electrical case. or magnetic noises. Yeah. Uh, discretization. Discretization. Okay. All right, and others. Um, how many of these are linear effects? Temperature's linear and some small range. Truly linear? Truly no. linear. None. Zero. Yeah. The, the, the tactile sensors are temperature sensitive, and that's a non-linear. Uh, vibration? Well, some, sometimes temperature is, is a linear thing. Yeah, are, are, are we talking truly linear, or can be approximated as linear? Yeah, appro linear enough that you can approximate it as linear. So a lot of times temperature stuff is linear. Vibration or um, well, it's going to be a constant offset. So I guess I guess you can kind of call that a, a call it linear or um, constant. Discretization. No. Mm -hmm. no, that's a step function. Basically. Right. So discretization, you're gonna. So so what's here? Well, you can use Shannon to, to undo a lot of that if you know the form of your. Way. No, I mean because suppose so to be linear if you. You know, if, if you were here and you had a little bit of an error, then <clears throat> the error would be, you know, the difference between there and there. But if you have twice that error, you have you don't have twice the uh, output error, right? It's going to be a nonlinear mapping. Yeah, yeah. Put out. Okay. So it's and, and also since this isn't a line, it's not linear. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Hey. Discretization is a lot like noise too, or, or like delay. As uh, as you're moving around along, you don't notice that something happened until this yeah, okay. thing happens, mm -hmm. and then you don't see it happen until that happens. Okay. Uh, delay is definitely nonlinear. Depending on what variant of four mechanical mounting you have, you can it might frequently be approxi approximate yeah. as linear if there's yeah. side loading, for example. That yeah. I think in general we're limiting everything to very specific instances in order to make it linear. Yeah, exactly. Do we have various there's forms of friction in here? Or is that considered external? Um, so and then, then you can just lump that everything that you don't understand right, right, into, um, and into Gaussian noise. Some sort of Gaussian noise source. So we're saying that we can model a lot of these things with a Gaussian? Well, okay, so what, what I want to say is that most of these are super hard to model. And so, and, um, and the mathematical tools for dealing with them aren't the greatest. Some things we have good tools for, like discretization of encoders. You can kind of use a state machine to know when you did a tick last and when not, and take the time and things like that, so you can deal with it. But usually what people do is just lump it all into saying, hey, we just have some Gaussian noise, which is a linear thing. Uh, and we know how to deal with that. And we'll just, you know, <coughs> figure out what the variance of the noise is and assume that it has a, you know, a real nice, um, real nice Gaussian distribution where you've got some sort of, some sort of variance on your signal and probability of having an outlier is really low and so most of the time you know if this is your signal and there's white Gaussian noise on it what you're really going to see is some sort of fuzz on top of it and you would 
never see something like an outlier. So can we go through outlier frequencies and ones of interest? Yep, and that's what we'll be talking about. Is this going to be handy one of those things like that? Okay. So that's uh, sources of noise. All right, so I wanted to talk about unique issues with humanoids. So what's unique about humanoids or legged systems as far as state estimation goes? Most of the time we can uh, we cannot rely on joint position to uh, uh, obtain the orientation in the world of the robot. Yeah, and why is that? Because it's not in permanent contact. Because it's not permanent contact. So we have can you restate that? Uh, just more loudly. Yep, so we have uh, intermittent contact with the world. And because of that, um, we can't, uh, can't measure things like um, orientation and center mass position and velocity. Um, using only joint sensors. Right, so whenever we jump? Whenever you jump, there's going to be error introduced, so you end up with drift if you try and do that. And not only jumping, uh, even though we might think our foot's flat on the ground, if you make that assumption, you're going to get large errors. Because, so let's just kind of look at that. Uh, let's see here. Suppose. You're trying to figure out uh, where your, this point on your body is. And you do that by assuming your foot's flat, and then do the kinematics using your ankle, knee, and hip. Okay. If your foot were flat, then you can get that super accurately. But what if your foot just moves a, a tiny bit? Well, back to the reasoning of why you need 0 0.03 radians on joint positions is a, a little motion here causes a large motion up here. So if, if your foot's uh, kind of kind of tipping on the ground like this, you're going to be way off. Or if you happen to you know step on a little rock so your foot's not flat on the ground anymore, you're going to be way off. There's some great videos of robots falling downstairs because of that. Uh, so you have to rely on some sort of external sensor, an IMU, that is measuring which way down is. So what's, so what's interesting is intermittent contact makes it hard to figure out which way down is. And because you have a small foot and a high center of mass, knowing which way down is is critical. So that, uh, that makes it interesting. And then same with center of mass velocity. If you, were to, if you were to assume that the foot was flat on the ground, here it would get even worse because if your foot's just wiggling a little bit, then it thinks that there's enormous velocity fluctuations up top. Um, so you can't assume that your foot's flat on the ground. What you can do, and what we do often, is assume that your ankle is is um, is not mo is not moving, or some or better yet, uh, a point of contact on the foot. So if you know that your foot is hitting the ground like that, then you can assume that that single point isn't moving, and that can be really useful. Or if you have a hand on the wall, uh, knowing that these fingers aren't moving with respect to the world it can be really useful in calculating velocities. Other thing you can do is, of course, use uh, camera and LiDAR and all that stuff to externally do velocities. But what we've been doing in VRC is, is using uh, points that we know are um, in contact with the world to help estimate velocity. Question on the um, uh, IMU. Yep. At low speeds, accelerations, you use the accelerometer to get a, a, an estimate on which way down is just by yep. that. And at higher speeds, you're using a, a, a deduced reckoning based on velocity? Based on the, the rate gyros. So the rate gyros tell you how fast you're spinning. And so low frequency accelerometer will tell you which way is down. It's pretty much just an um, inclinometer that will tell you which way is down. And then um, 
using that at low frequencies and the uh, rate gyros at high frequency, fusing them together with something like a Kelman filter that we'll talk about in a second, you get the best of high frequency and low frequency essentially, and you get a good. Is it is it theoretically accurate? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Anything else unique about humanoid robots that make uh, state estimation challenging? That's pretty much a big one, is, is mm -hmm. that intermittent contact, right? If your robot arm bolted to the ground, then you don't need a, a gyro on board or a accelerometer, then everything can be done with um, right. joint sensors. And it's not uniquely intermediate contact, but it uh, might be also, also that uh, the, the contact, like when you are in contact, you can still sleep, yeah. not guaranteed to. Uh, yeah, so intermittent on unknown or you know yeah because because even when you do the the point cure assuming that a point's not moving and you do slip it becomes a problem that's why you don't want to trust that perfectly either and put mm -hmm. it in some sort of state estimator but it's less what then uh, was than the food yeah it's like exactly the, and the sometimes you uh, and a slip typically is like a very discrete event that stops mm -hmm. so sometimes you we don't do this mm -hmm. currently but I think we could detect those and then just wipe out that data point. But but slipping is definitely a non-linear thing, right? You're not mm -hmm. slipping and all of a sudden you're slipping. Uh, question just very briefly. In an ideal world, if we didn't know where we were and didn't care, but just knew how off we were from where we wanted to be without knowing where either was, but we know the degree of correction needed in its direction. Yeah. And we could just apply those forces and torques in that vector to correct. Would that be enough? Would, would yeah. Well, in, in, be in, in fact, if we had that information directly. In fact, knowing your position for balance is irrelevant, right? You don't care where your position is. Right. You only really need to know where your position of your center mass is with respect to the foot. Uh, no. And, uh, and that, that, and that comes from really knowing the orientation of your body is the most critical thing. The orientation of your body for for balance. The orientation of your body and your center mass velocity. So with respect to a balanced vector, yes. whichever way up is right. Yep. So if we could sense that orientation and, and, and the degree of lean from the stability vector directly inertially, then we wouldn't be subject to these geometric and, and, and other well, However you're measuring it, you have to do something about it. That's all I'm saying. You right. don't have to know it precisely, but something needs to deal with it. So if we just know what to do about it yeah. and how much, and in which direction we don't need to know right. exactly. But for this discussion, so. we're assuming that we want to know it perfectly. All right, I agree. All right, so let's talk about. Uh, so one way of doing all this stuff is just simple filtering. Just remove noise, or is it common? Pretty much just remove noise. So, so take your sensors, put them through some sort of. Um, some sort of simple physics or whatever, so like kinematics or whatever, uh, to get your state. And that's going to be noisy, because your sensors are noisy. Put them through some sort of filter, and hope for the best. Some sort of low-pass filter or whatever band head, if you know, you know, some things have a good frequency range, whatever, just design your filter to take the components you like, and then hopefully these are then um, uh, not noisy state. Your state has to be. Assuming everything's observable? In this, yeah. So usually we uh, transform first the sensor measurements to obtain the noisy state, and then filter. Or you could also that. you could also put a filter in here first. So let's draw it more like that, because I think oftentimes we'll do this where we'll filter the sensors a little bit, do some sort of math to figure out what we really want, get the noisy state, do a filter on that, and a state estimate, and then if we want a velocity of a signal the filter will be a differentiator. Yeah. So let's take a real simple example. Uh, suppose you just have a mass and you have a sensor that 
it's measuring X and it's pretty no and it's, it has some noise on it. And suppose, um, oh, let's say that we're pushing the mass. So we know the force that we're pushing it with. And but then something else is also pushing it. Some disturbance vector, uh, some disturbance force W that we that we can't measure. Okay. So we're measuring X sub M, X measure. Okay. So we could um, just take X measurement. It's a little bit noisy, so put it through a low-pass filter to get X estimate, and then maybe put it through a differentiator to get a noisy um, X dot. Hold on, and then put it through another low-pass filter. <coughs> Good. X dot S. Okay. Would a, would a viable option be to take X S and then simply differentiate that since the noise is Yep. Yep. You could do that, or um, so you could instead put it like that. Uh, they're kind of mathematically equivalent if you. You know, if you go through this low pass filter, if as long as let everything's linear. Ordering of blocks doesn't matter. Okay. So if you were to first low pass filter, then differentiate, then low pass filter, that would be the same as differentiating, then low pass filtering twice. Okay. And so the simplest low pass filter um, is just an alpha filter, which in I'll show a discrete time version. We use this a lot in our code. Uh, you just say xn plus one equals alpha times xn plus one minus alpha whatever the input is, <coughs> so I'll, I'll x measurement. Okay, so if, if alpha is zero, and then that just means that you're not doing any filtering. And then plus one. What's that? Um, if alpha is zero, then you're not doing any filtering. You're just passing the signal straight through. If alpha equals one, then you're ignoring your input and just saying you're completely filtering it so much that you're just keeping x constant. And then somewhere in between there, you get a different frequency cut off. Okay. Yeah. So that's just a simple alpha filter. Um, since you're in a, in a linear domain, what would it be? I, I guess the, the transfer function is one over s plus uh, a over a over s plus a. So u is what you think it should be, so this is some error. So pretty much you correct your signal based on the, the error. So the signal correction has a dot over it. Is that velocity or position? X is a position. X dot just means that you're updating your position based on your error. So but anyway, let's, okay, so let's not dwell on that. Okay. There is a nice uh, page uh, on that on Wikipedia. Okay. Like explaining how to uh, compute the cutoff frequency and all yeah. that stuff. And if you look at a low pass filter, the Bode diagram pretty um, much just goes like that. Sure. Where this is frequency, magnitude, and this then the cutoff frequency would be yeah. A in radians per second. Okay, so this is all pretty straightforward, but but a lot of times in our software, when we're being lazy and it doesn't really matter, we'll just do this real simple stuff. So back to here, what we would do in this case would be, um, well, doing the orientation based on the IMU signals, so the accelerometer and the, um, and 
rate gyros is a, is a little more complicated than just doing it this way, although you could do it this way. Uh, there will, but oftentimes with the IMU, you just get a signal off of it, you get orientation. So there we could just say the, sig the sensor is the orientation from the IMU and we do some filtering. But as far as like center mass position, let's just take a quick look at that. Or in fact, let's not even call it center mass position. Let's just say position of a point on the body for now. If we knew that this point was in contact and we trust something else giving us an orientation which way down is, and we want to know where that point is, then it's just the kinematics, right? Just put a Put a reference frame here, orient it with respect to the world reference frame, which we can do because we know which way the, orient the world is oriented. Put a reference frame here, and then just figure out the rotation matrix from A to B. Or sorry, the, the tra uh, homogeneous transform, which gives the rotation and the translation. Look at the translation component, and that's the vector from one to the other. And this is just a function of the, the joint angles between the two. Then if we want to know the velocity at that point, so this would be point, uh, point B. If we want to know the velocity at that point, we could simply take point B and put it through a differentiator. And a filter. get our estimated point dot p dot b. That would be one way. The other way would be to use all the twists that Colin had talked about and, and you know compute the twist of let's see here, a to b and e to b or a's frame, whatever. Um, I guess this is And then that would give us the velocity at that point. Very briefly explain the twist. Uh, nope, because okay. we've got a whole three hours of lectures on twists okay. that you can watch. Okay. Uh, but pretty much it's just the velocity of this. And that's going to be a function of the angles and the velocities. And it's going to be you know some Jacobian matrix times, that's a function of the joint angles times the velocity. Okay, so twist is just an name for that scene. Yeah, it's, it's combining the, the linear and angular velocity of a frame. Okay. okay, so that's two ways to do it. One, one use a Jacobian uh, through the joints, knowing the joint angular velocities. The other way is to just compute the kinematics and differentiate them. They both work. Um, if you have really good joint velocities, then you want to do the Jacobian method. Uh, because it's going to be better than just differentiating kinematics. But if you're getting your joint velocities just by differentiating the joint angles anyway, it's going to be pretty, pretty similar. Computationally, one might be faster than the other, but... So. Okay, so then that would give you points. And then for computing the center mass, you, you know, compute the center mass of all the little masses and take the weighted average. Which you can do in one big matrix that I won't talk about here uh, today. Let's see here. Okay, so that's the simple filtering methods. All right. Now, these more interesting state estimators. Are essentially so a state estimator essentially simulates the system, <coughs> sees how bad it's simulating based on the sensors, and corrects the simulation based, based on an error measurement. Is it the same as an observer? Ah, uh, yeah. So I would argue that humans are extremely good at doing this sort of thing. In fact, a little philosophy here. Um, 
a lot of what people would call magic or even humor or whatever uh, is you know you simulating your world expecting something and then bam you get hit with something you don't expect and it just throws off your state estimator and you get kind of this wall moment where you gotta resync your state estimator right <laughs> Okay. That might be the nerdiest description I've ever heard for magic and humor, but I like it. Uh, let's see. So you you simulate your system. You have a simulation of your system going, or also called a model. It's taken in its your inputs. So, um, you know, so like your joint torques or whatever, <coughs> and. Estimating some sort of state. state estimate. Then you have your your real system going along, and it's going to have some sort of um, measurements coming off of it. So there's going to be some sort of uh, you know, sensors, and so you're going to get some sort of measurement signal. And then your state estimate, then you're going to have some sort of sensor model. Um, and the output of that is going to be your an estimate of what your measurements should be. Measurement estimate. Okay. And so there's going to be some comparison between the two. And if there's a difference between the two, then you're going to do some sort of update to your, to your state estimate. So the state estimate and real action. So that's what you're interested in. Uh, the input should no, be no, no, real. Sorry. Sorry. It's just going to do some sort of, some sort of, I'm just trying to show that it's doing some sort of update to your state estimate. Yeah. But shouldn't it update the, the status of the robot also? Well, no, you don't. Change an actual setting. Well, these, these same inputs are going both to the robot. That would be your control system. So then you can have some controller that takes your that takes your state estimate and determines your inputs. Right? That's independent, though. But that's independent, right? So we won't worry about that. Right now, we're just trying to do measurement, not control. Now, you go. You compare your. You could go the other way and estimate your states based on your s the sensors and then compare your sensor the state estimate versus the state estimated from the sensor measurements and right you can probably flip the boxes around yeah this is typically but this how is how we do it implemented okay um, yeah and there, there should be I guess I should have drawn a little update block in here just to So in the simplest system, one sensor, just a distance measurement from zero to one meter on a mass, for example. Say the real position is 0.5 meters exactly. Yep. But the measurement is 0.51 meters. What would happen as we trace through this block? Okay, so if the real is at 0.5, but the sensor has some noise in it so that this says it's 0.51, and right now, suppose the state... Um, Suppose the, uh, and, and we need to also, the, the, initial state, the state estimate initial. kind of feeds back to the simulation model. Okay. okay, so suppose the estimate in state right now is, I don't know, 0.49? Sure. Okay, then the sensor model would say, oh, well my state's 0.49, so the measurement should be 0.49. Okay, and then I would see that, gee, there's 0 0.02 error in here. <coughs> So I'd say, okay, I gotta make an update here. So instead of this being 0.49, let's make it be 0.493 for the next tick. And so that'll go in the simulation model. Yep. So the simulation will will kind of grow towards what the sensor is saying. 493. How do we get to the 493 again? Just because that's it's what my closer. update, my arbitrary update <laughs> law said to get a little bit closer. Oh, okay. Um, you could have a real 
strong update law, which just says, hey, it's off by 0.02, I'm going to update it to 0 0.02, 0 0.51. But then what you're saying is you're assuming your measurements are perfect. Right, and we don't want to do that. Right. We know there's no Because we want to film them. Yep. Understood. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so that's pretty much the general idea. Let me get a little bit more. Uh, any questions on this before we actually start talking about uh, like the real common filter? No, this is very clear. So this is the very basics. Um, let's let's take a break. <laughs>